Hi, everyone. Um, this is Michael Leslie Rule, and I'm um, working with the Women's Funding Network on producing these uh, webinars through this year. Um, we just were having a little bit of technical difficulty, so if you could just bear with us for about a minute, um, we will start the webinar. Okay, so um, I think we're ready to go. Um, just to start out, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, um, just to start out, I want to give you a little bit of an overview about the Women's Spending Network. Um, we're the largest philanthropic network of philanthropists and leaders who promote investment in women and girls. So last year alone, our network invested over $410 million to results-focused programs and initiatives to advance women, girls, and their communities on a local and global scale. Um, today, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us for the very first webinar of 2017. We're here with Cynthia Hess from the Institute for Women's Policy Research and Shante Avant of Women's Foundation for a Greater Memphis. Um, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping at the top of the top of our time together. Um, it's a six. We have sixty minutes, and hopefully, we're going to divide that time um, between about twenty minutes um, of presentation for um, Shante and for. Um, and for Cynthia, 20 minutes each, and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. So um, we invite your questions. Please either write them down or add them into the platform under the, um, the questions pull-down menu, um, and we'll get to them at the, at the end of our, our time together. Um, so you'll be muted throughout the presentations, so we can sort of minimize background noise. But we know, as I said, that questions come up, um, so please submit them through the pop-up in the presentation box. Um, and it's on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, there's, let's see, there's underneath audio webcam, then there's questions and you can submit them there. Um, let's see, if you'd like to submit a question during the Q&A session that you, um, that you don't wanna submit sort of as a written question, you can raise your hand um, and I'll unmute you um, and you can share your question directly with the speakers. Uh, my colleague Candace Elder will be live tweeting this webinar, so if you're part of the social media community, please join in on the conversation. Women's Funding Network's Twitter handle is at Women's Funding. IWPR's handle is at IWPR. And Women's Foundation for a Greater Memphis can be found on Twitter at WFGM underscore ORG. Um, finally, we're recording today's webinar, so it can be available to you and your staff for future learning purposes. So let's start by introducing Cynthia Hess. Um, Cynthia Hess is an Associate Director of Research at IWPR. She's directed IWPR projects on numerous issues, including the status of women in the United States, women's activism and leadership, immigration and social security. Currently, she directs IWPR's Job Training Success Project, which investigates gaps in the provision of supportive services across the workforce development system and how these gaps can be addressed. I'm gonna share Cynthia's scene, <laughs> screen. Oh. Um, and Cynthia, we're just waiting for your screen to come up. Great, so take it away. Okay, great, thank you. And um, thank you for the um, opportunity to be a part of this today. Um, I'm going to share some findings from uh, the research initiative IWPR has been working on for the past two years, the Job Training Success Project, which was 
designed to examine the landscape of supportive services like child care and transportation assistance in the workforce development system and to uh, assess, to, to really look at um, uh, what services are offered, how available are they, where are the gaps in services, um, what are some of the key unmet support needs that women and men in job training have, and how can these needs um, be better addressed. We started the project um, a couple of years ago um, in part because we knew that while job training is important to giving many women the skills they need to get better paying jobs, women often face um, challenges that can make it hard to enroll in and complete training programs. There was a general sense among experts in the field that a lack of access to supportive services was an important reason why, but very little research had been done to look at what are the specific support service needs that women in job training have, how widely available are these supports, what difference does it make when women's supportive service needs are met, um, what's, what, um, what kind of an impact do these supports have on outcomes. And so these are some of the questions that we're looking at in this project. And the ultimate goal of the project is really to build a body of evidence on the role of supportive services and job training success that could be used to initially to initiate dialogue about the effectiveness of these supports and promising practices in their delivery and to make the case for increased investment in these services. So to get at the To get at the, these kinds of questions, we used a number of different research methods. Um, we started the project with a series of about 25 interviews with experts in the workforce development field to learn about their perceptions of the availability of supportive services and workforce development programs, key service gaps, and um, uh, their uh, ideas about programs that are actively involved in providing robust su support. Um, we also conducted a review and analysis of existing literature on the importance, effectiveness, and availability of supportive services for participants in job training and education. And the results of that review um, were published in the report, um, Supportive Services in Job Training and Education, a research review. Um, we also did a study profiling eight programs across the country that provide supportive services to job training participants and the challenges they face in their work and um, strategies for um, increasing access to supportive services. And um, we also fielded two online national surveys, one of administrators at job training programs that was fielded last spring. and. Um, one of program participants, and we uh, there was a report released on um, the administrator survey report uh, in December, um, and the report on the findings from the participant survey will be released um, in the next month or two. Um, so these two surveys um, looked at the availability and importance of about 18 different supportive services in job training programs and the greatest unmet needs among women and men uh, job training participants and the relationship between supportive services and program outcomes. And I want to just say a few things about um, what we found in those surveys, um, but first want to um, just give a little bit of a description about the samples uh, for the surveys and who participated in them. Um, Sorry, while I try to share this as a slideshow. Um, Okay. Um, is this okay? Is this working? I'm not sure what everyone can see. Uh, what we can see is a presenter mode. So you, you're, uh, we can see both slides: the slide all the way to the right that says "next slide," and then the center slide. Um, 
Um, okay, do you know oh, if you how, to, to, how to get it to display the correctly? Left from current slide on the left hand side. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure why you're in prevent, presenter load, but I but I would just continue. It's I think it's it's okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, so for both surveys, we receive responses from community and technical colleges, um, from job course centers, and from other training centers at community-based organizations. And we were particularly interested in programs that offer occupational skills training and participants who are getting this kind of training in a variety of fields. We had um, 168 programs that provide occupational skills training, respond to the administrator survey, and about 1,900 trainees um, respond to our participant survey, which included about uh, 1,500 individuals who were currently enrolled in job training programs and about 400 who'd been enrolled in the past. So um, the samples were not representative, but they do include all but just a few of the states. And um, these relatively large sample sizes means that um, the data gives some interesting insight into administrator and participant perspectives on supportive service needs and challenges. Um, I think it's, it's also worth noting that the sample for the participant survey has differing characteristics in several ways from the sample of participants uh, in Workforce Investment Act funded programs nationally. Our sample has a larger share of women, um, is younger on the whole, and also has a smaller share of parents. We also had a fairly large percentage of respondents to the participant survey who were receiving, J uh, who were receiving training through Job Corps, um, about 46%, and 17% were at a community college, and 36% were at another type of training center. And then for the administrator survey, about half of the respondents were administrators at workforce development programs at community colleges, and the other half were at programs in other settings. When we looked at um, administrator and participant perspectives on the importance of supportive services, we found that among both, there was strong agreement that these services are absolutely vital to program completion. 97% of administrators said that supportive services are important or very important for program retention and completion. And when we asked program participants who received services how important they were to their ability to stay in their training program, for each of 18 services that we asked about, 80% or more said they were important. And I included just um, one quote from a participant who filled out the survey who said, oh, sorry, from an, this is from an administrator, who said, supportive services are critical. All the training and job placement efforts in the world aren't going to be effective if the trainee can't get to or from work, doesn't have childcare resources, or can't overcome other barriers to getting and keeping the job. So both administrators and participants believe strongly that these services play a critical role in helping women and men in training address life challenges that can make it difficult to complete training and this figure um, shows what the administrators surveyed think are the most common reasons participants do not finish their training. Um, financial considerations are at the top of the list. And um, when we asked participants the same question, we got pretty much the same answer. Paying bills was, was what they identified as being their greatest obstacle. Insufficient child care um, was the second most common reason cited by administrators. Um, for non-completion, followed by problems with work hours or scheduling conflicts. Um, child care didn't figure quite as prominently in the responses for our participant survey overall, most likely because we did have a relatively small share of parents in the sample. But when we looked at just parents um, in that survey, insufficient child care was cited as a significant obstacle to completion. Um, and in fact, more than a third of respondents who had young children and received child care assistance said they would not have been um, able to even enroll in training had it not been for the child care help that they received. The data from the surveys provide evidence that supportive services do make a difference. 62% of administrators who say their participants' needs are met well or extremely well report having program completion rates of 80% or higher and only 30% who say their participant support service needs are not are, um, are met well report having um, such high completion rates. 
We also found that participants who had more of their support service needs met were more likely to complete their program and get a job after training, especially when the supports they received were targeted to meet specific needs. So for example, if a person said they had a need for childcare and transportation and received both childcare assistance and transportation assistance, they were more likely to complete their program and get a job than if they had both of those needs and received only one or neither of these services. Um, and what we found was that each time an additional supportive services was provided to address a challenge that a participant faced, their probability of completing the program increased by nine percentage points. Um, and that analysis was controlled for a range of factors like gender, race, age, education, marital status, earnings, program setting, et cetera. Um, and we found that the results were statistically significant. Um, supportive services do lead to better outcomes, which suggests that if we want to increase credentialing, we also need to increase access to supports. Um, and um, just one quote from a participant who said, all the assistance I received from this program has been incredibly important in keeping me in my program. Without it, I have to make decisions like whether to pay for rent or food or pay for school fees. Although both administrators and participants are um, well aware of the importance of supportive services to job training participants, uh, we found that um, you know the reality is that many participants don't receive services or have or have access to all the supports they need. This graph um, shows the percentage of administrators in the survey who say that at least half of their participants receive each of um, these different supportive um, service types. Case management and financial education and counseling were the most uh, commonly received services, followed by transportation assistance and help with accessing public benefits. Um, the most common supports received by the participants we surveyed were um, actually a little bit different. The respondents um, to that survey were most likely to say that uh, they were getting help with accessing computers and technology, peer support, or life coaching. And um, in both services, sur uh, both surveys, services requiring um, specialized expertise or special facilities like um, legal services, substance abuse counseling, housing assistance, were among the services that were least likely um, to be received. Um, the provision of supports varies according to the context of the training. Um, we found that community and technical colleges were less likely to provide most supports than community-based training programs, um, and their participants were less likely to be getting supports um, from any source, which suggests that um, better integration across the workforce development systems could benefit programs in both contexts. So actually, community um, colleges were less likely to provide most supports, but there were a few supports that they were more likely to provide, like child care assistance, peer support, um, and emergency cash assistance. We also found that shorter programs typically provide more services than longer programs. Um, and they also have higher completion rates, which indicates that um, supportive services are going to be important if we want to support workers to get the quality credentials that may come with longer training programs. And then larger budgets also um, provided more services uh, than smaller budget programs, and programs serving more low-income participants provided more services than those serving smaller numbers of low-income participants. Um, Programs serving fewer parents also provided more services than those serving more parents, um, and that may be due partly to the characteristics of those programs. Um, with fewer parents, they tend to be shorter in duration and also larger budget programs, so they tend to be the kinds of programs that typically have more services. Given um, these differences in support service provision um, across program types, it's um, not surprising that the extent to which participants' needs are met also varies across different types of programs. Overall, um, only 20% of administrators we surveyed said they thought their participants' supportive service needs were met well or extremely well. Um, in general, the types of programs that provide more services um, were more likely to say that their participants' needs are met well, um, and those with fewer services less likely to say so. Um, so programs with the smaller budgets and those serving more parents are especially likely to say their participants' needs are not met well. 
Um, we asked program administrators what difference it makes when their participants don't have their supportive service needs met. And the answer was, you know, basically it makes um, a, a large difference. 81% said that their program success rates would improve if they were better able to meet the support needs of their participants. 72% said that the unmet support needs of their participants have a negative effect on their um, success in job training. And only 1% said that access to support services has little um, or no impact on their participants' success in job training. We wanted to know what the greatest unmet needs were and whether there were significant gender differences. Um, so what are the gaps in services for women and are these similar to or different from the gaps for men? Um, the survey asked administrators um, who responded to identify the five greatest unmet needs for women and the five greatest for men in their programs. And they actually chose many of the same needs for women and men. Emergency cash assistance, housing assistance, transportation and mental health counseling were among the most common for both women and men. Um, but there were also a few important gender differences. The biggest was with childcare. 66% of administrators surveyed ranked childcare assistance among the top unmet needs for their female participants, um, compared with only 21% who said the same for men. Um, and that's not too surprising given that um, that this is a significant unmet need because it is one of the services that's less widely received by job training participants and that training providers less commonly offer. Um, we found that about one in five program administrators um, provide child care directly and about half refer participants to partner organizations for the service, which is a more feasible way for, for many um, programs to do it. Um, but what we found is that it's still not enough to meet the needs. Um, domestic violence services was another um, important gender difference in unmet needs. Um, a third, 32% of administrators identified this as one of the five greatest unmet needs for their female participants, compared with um, about 13% um, who identified it as a need for men. And then substance abuse counseling um, is one that administrators were considerably more likely to see as an unmet unmet need for men, 40% um, um, compared with 28% for women. Um, now, when we asked participants to identify their unmet needs and how many needs they have, um, women were slightly more likely than men to say they have a few or many unmet needs. And they were um, considerably more likely than men to say they wish they had received more help with childcare um, and more likely to say they would have liked more help accessing or applying for public benefits, mental health mm -hmm. counseling, healthcare services, and financial counseling and education. And men were more likely than women to say they would like help getting food, peer support, substance abuse counseling, and parenting support. Given that so many administrators feel their participants' supportive service needs are not met, it's not surprising that basically all of them, 99%, um, say they would like to expand the services they offer. Um, when we asked what services they would like to provide or provide more of, um, the most common answers were help with childcare and emergency cash assistance, um, transportation assistance, housing, and mental health counseling. So those answers you know, basically correspond with what administrators perceive the greatest unmet needs to be. Despite the desire to provide more services, only about one-third of administrators expects that they will be able to do so in the near future. And um, the most common reason people gave for not providing more supportive services is lack of funding, um, that the resources simply are not there. Um, other common, resource, common reasons were not having enough staff to do so, um, rules and regulations that make it difficult to provide the services they want. Um, such as restrictions on how funding can be used and not being able to find an area partner to provide the service. Only one in five administrators says funding for their programs increased over the last program year. Community and technical colleges were much less likely to have seen an increase in funding than job training programs in other settings. So um, in the face of these sorts of funding and other challenges that um, organizations have to contend with, um, many are still finding ways to offer supportive services and try to maximize their reach and impact. Um, in the surveys and interviews um, that we've done as a part of this project, 
a number of strategies for increasing access to supportive services have emerged. Um, one it was uh, using integrated case management to help training participants navigate across systems. Um, many of the program administrators um, said they believe working with a case manager who can help participants um, access supportive services can be one of the most um, important elements of training. Um, and having a single case manager who helps access a range of services rather than several who provide access to different services is key. When we looked at um, the impact of case management on outcomes for participants who completed our survey, we found that case management did, um, in fact, lead to better employment outcomes when we controlled for a range of factors. Um, having a case manager while in training um, increased the probability of finding a job after training by 17 percentage points. If that case manager helped the participant to access supportive services, then the probability of finding a job increased by 33 percentage points. Um, targeting support to um, to address clients' greatest unmet needs was another um, strategy that emerged in the research in the research for increasing access to supportive services and maximizing their impact. Um, you know, this can involve setting up community partnerships to address um, some of the issues that tend to fall under the radar sometimes, but are among the more urgent needs like mental health counseling and domestic violence. Um, one example of how organizations have done this that um, came up in the research is a group of five organizations in the greater Cincinnati area that set up a pilot project to increase access to domestic violence services among job training participants in the area. Um, that project was established after program leaders and staff had heard anecdotally that domestic violence was a significant problem for many women in job training in the area, um, and the partners worked with um, the YWCA, a regional expert on domestic violence, to train program staff on how to screen for domestic violence during intake and to help uh, them uh, become equipped to help participants access services when a disclosure is made. Um, another strategy that came up uh, was being on the lookout and making use of underutilized sources of funding, SNAP ENT was frequently mentioned as one such source of funding for supportive services because it offers 50% um, reimbursements um, that are uncapped federal grants that reimburse states for up to half of certain non-federal SNAP ENT program costs, including supportive services like childcare and transportation. Um, very few organizations in our study received this funding, and a number of experts we spoke with said there's a larger trend of underutilization of this research that's probably due to um, a couple of factors, including um, possibly a lack of awareness about the availability of the funds and difficulty covering the 50% state contribution. Um, and then the fourth, um, a fourth strategy or fourth strategy for increasing access to supportive services that came up um, in the research was developing strategic partnerships. Um, in our administrator survey, 80% of respondents said they provide services to their job training participants through partnerships of some kind, either by making referrals to other organizations or working with organizations that are close partners. Um, one of the interesting uh, findings in the data on partnerships was that the strength of the relationship um, seemed to matter. Close partnerships were associated with higher program completion rates. Um, we didn't find the same relationship between better program outcomes and services provided through partnerships if the partnerships we're with an organization that was not um, a close partner organization. Um, and then we also found that close partnerships were not necessarily all that common. Um, for almost all of the 16 supportive services we looked at for the administrator survey, fewer than half of the organizations reported having a close partner who helps them meet that need, which suggests that stronger partnerships with referral agencies um, need to be encouraged. Um, so just um, in closing, I guess I would touch on a couple of strategies for building stronger partnerships that the um, administrators we surveyed and interviewed um, frequently brought up. One was making partnership building a strategic priority of the organization. As one person said, you know, it's really important that I'm backed up by my organization. Cultivating partners, uh, cultivating partners is seen here as a value and not a time waster. Um, and uh, so I'm free you know, to, to devote a significant amount of time um, working on this. Um, 
they also spoke about um, the importance of um, establishing partnerships that reduce duplication across systems and organizations, and about the cost effectiveness of partnerships and supportive service provision. We found that when we asked um, program administrators about their strategies for providing supportive services in a cost effective way, given the generally limited nature of funding, um, the answer we almost always got was, well, our, you know, our main strategy is that um, you know, we make use of the services that are already available in the community, and you know, then we do our best to cover what isn't already offered. Um, so in future research, we'd like to explore further what um, are some strategies for establishing and maintaining effective partnerships, and what kinds of partnerships might have the most potential for increasing access to supportive services within the workforce development system. Um, but I think um, Shante um, will be able to speak some to the issue of partnerships as well, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to her. Cynthia, thank you so much. Um, Appreciate it. Um, yeah, as Cynthia said, we're gonna we're gonna transition to Shante Avant, who is gonna tell us a little bit about the Women's Foundation for Greater Memphis's Vision 2020 strategy, and I think demonstrate um, some of what Cynthia's uh, research suggests, sort of on the feet within um, a women's foundation. So. Shante Avant is the Deputy Director of the Women's Foundation for Greater Memphis, and she manages WFGM's staff and operations. At the foundation, she is responsible for grant allocations, creating strategic partnerships to collaborate with corporate partners, stewarding relationships with national foundations and local community-based organizations, and institutional giving and large donor stewardship. She has over 20 years of nonprofit experience, specifically with agencies focused on women and children. Um, Shante, I'm going to have you take it away, and you're definitely not in presenter mode. Good. Okay. Is everyone able to see my screen okay? Uh, yes, we can see it. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you again for um, inviting me to participate in this webinar today, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to share a little bit about our work. Um, I think Cynthia's presentation was such a great validation for the um, work that we as a Women's Foundation have taken on um, over the last few years uh, with a more strategic place-based strategy. And I want to share a little bit about how our strategic partnership um, is Hello? I think we're having some technical difficulties. Um, it doesn't sound like I... Shante, are you there?
Hello? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Shante? Yes. yes, you can hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. No idea what happened. All right, wonderful. Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll re push the restart button. Please go back to the beginning, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, just to get some context, I, I started out by mentioning that um, I was very happy to ask to be participate to participate in the webinar, and I think my presentation will segue very well into some of the findings that Cynthia's report um, in the presentation that she shared, some of the ways that the Women's Foundation has created a very strategic partnership to identify some of the needs of low-income families within our community. For more than 20 years, the Women's Foundation has been an organization of women helping women break the cycle of poverty, and that's through philanthropy, through leadership, and through collaboration. And what I'll focus on today is more around the collaboration and the strategic partnerships that we've built um, to support low-income families within our community. The mission of the foundation is to encourage philanthropy and foster leadership among women and support programs that enable women and children to reach their full potential. We've done that through what we are calling our Vision 2020 plan. In 2015, the Women's Foundation launched our Vision 2020 strategic plan, where the overall goal is to reduce poverty by 5% over five years in zip code 38126. Just to give the audience some context, um, zip code 38126, um, which happens to be the highest uh, concentrated poverty within our community. Um, the poverty rate in Memphis is about 28%. The poverty rate in zip code 38126 is 62%. And the child poverty rate is 76%. So when the Women's Foundation decided to launch our strategic plan, it was really focused on a place-based strategy that could really support a model that could be taken to scale that if we're able to do such um, a, uh, such a great lift in one community that has so many needs, then it's definitely something that could be replicated in other parts of our community. Just to give you all uh, a little insight about some of the families that we're serving, um, this area, where 38126, is also kind of the hub of some revitalization that's happening within our community. We um, partnered with the City of Memphis and Memphis Housing Authority to really focus in on a concentrated uh, public housing development um, that's located within the community. And of that public housing unit, which is called Foot Homes, um, at the beginning of this project, there were 414 families that were living within this community, and only about 97 of those individuals um, were um, able-bodied working adults that were working at least 30 hours Per week. The average uh, income, annual income of individuals that were living in foot homes is about $8,300. And it also gives you the percentage of the number of kindergartners who were um, able to demonstrate at the beginning of the school year that they were functioning at age appropriate levels, uh, 44 in language and only 16 in math. So it gives you some idea of exactly how uh, a little bit more detailed demographics of the families that were being served within our community. I'd like to discuss a little bit about the way we have created what is called this public-private partnership. We, the Women's Foundation, saw ourselves as really the backbone organization to really support efforts um, for some of the most disenfranchised members of our community. We understood, based on our over 13 years of uh, work at, in a public-private partnership space with the City of Memphis, with the Housing Authority, with Housing and Community Development, and with the community-based organizations that we had funded, that it was important to have really create a more comprehensive collective impact model to support how services to be delivered to families. Um, in creating ourselves as a backbone organization and the philanthropic lead, um, we knew that it was important to have strategies and actions. We knew it was important to have resources, and that's really where um, our, the arm of 
our arm of being a philanthropic organization was important, that it was important to have stream, uh, seamless communication to all of the partners and then to create technical assistance to support them. From those, um, from those ideals, we then created um, the goals of Vision 2020. Goal one is really focused on securing resources to meet the basic needs of our families in 38126. Goal two is focused on marketable job skills that enable our residents, residents to gain uh, living, employment wage, um, living wage employment. Goal three is really focused on children age zero to five being ready and prepared to enter kindergarten. Goal four is really focused on positive outcomes for youth that include confidence, confidence and character. And then goal five is really focused on the financial education needed to help our families to reduce poverty. In 2016, um, we invested our first, made our first strategic investment in zip code 38126. And I've listed the grantee partners that we have focused in on to meet each of those five goals. And I think now is a good point for me to really discuss or share with you that in creating this public-private partnership, we knew it was important to really utilize the resources of folks who are already doing work within this community. But if given um, the ability and resources, how they can move and scale up those opportunities for families in 38126. So we were very um, thoughtful in our process of how we selected our grantee partners. Um, capacity building was really what we focused on in the first year of our investment. So these organizations really could help us advance these goals. Um, and one of the key pieces that we knew for this work was going to be the case management. So in goal one, you see that there are two organizations that um, we're investing in that provide comprehensive case management and supportive services to our families. And then the other organizations are really focused on those needs that include the marketable job skills, really supporting families and their children, um, and then also the financial education. What was important or, uh, or a cornerstone for us is really that we provided, we utilized any of the strategies in working with our partners um, and case management for our, our families was focused on a two-generation approach. When you talk about employment-ready programs or workforce development programs, um, one of the things that I think was um, very revealing in Cynthia's presentation was really how the supportive services if not addressed, you really can't meet those needs for families in a way that will help them both retain employment and then um, maintain employment. So our two-generation approach, which uh, is a national, nationally recognized approach, helps us identify what those needs are for families. And identifying what those needs are for families means that you also are identifying what those needs are for their children. Um, for adults, uh, making sure that we have um, for each adult, there is an individual assessment plan that is um, um, provided from each individual, um, and our case managers provide that assessment for each family. But there's also a family development plan that's created. So individually, some of the needs that you have, but what is really the needs that you have for your entire family? So that as case managers are helping prepare our families towards economic self-sufficiency and eventually security, we're identifying what those needs are. So for instance, with an adult, um, adult literacy, life skills, and job training and vocational development, workforce development is a, are important factors to help them really move to post-secondary education and or job training um, and career development. But it's also important for children that the family literacy, the early childhood education, and out of school time that we focus that to help our um, young adults eventually move to both post-secondary and then um, economic, economic mobility as well. When case managers complete these individual assessment plans, um, these are where we identify if there are needs, um, particular needs and supportive services that may include mental health needs, substance abuse needs, childcare needs, 
And I want to share that part of our um, model for really supporting our families is that we create, we have case managers who are working with our families, but then we've kind of nuanced this program over the, year, over the years so that we have case managers that are specific um, and rich in content for some of the areas that are of most need for our families. So for instance, um, not only do we have workforce development case managers, but we also have an education case manager as well as a health case managers because over the time in working with low-income families, um, we found that these are some of the areas where there needs to be more resources and attention um, to prepare um, women to be ready and uh, to prepare women to, to enter the workforce. Um, and it's important at this stage when you're doing that individual assessment um, so that you can identify what the needs are, what areas of interest are, that you can also take time to see what particular um, organizations could provide those needs. It's a critical point that if there are some mental health issues that you identify that on the front end, not at the time that you're putting them into an employment program, but really on the front end of that assessment. If there are substance abuse issues, to identify those things on the front end. If there are child care issues, um, to identify those things on the front end. And when we've worked with a lot of our families, because of those areas, we have created um, a nuance, the model, so that we're meeting the specific needs of families, hence the development of not only the workforce development case managers, but also an education case manager and a health case manager. Um, the LEARN model is really just one of the ways in, what, in which we assess the needs. Um, your resident needs are then identified. You are providing service, service links. So those are resources of the community-based organizations that they are referred to. Um, resident strengths are then pulled out. Because um, obviously, um, many of the solutions that are identified for our, our families are really solutions that they create for themselves. And they should be a part of that process. And then, of course, um, identifying what programs um, either uh, parent and or children would be entering into. And that case management is a continual process. It isn't just a um, finite amount of time, but it really is that the case manager works with the family through the long haul. That could be 18 months. That could be two and a half years. But in creating this public-private partnership where we have focused resources into this one community, we've identified resources needed to support our families um, through a transition um, that could take years. Um, just as a, to give you some insight about how we will evaluate this particular program, we're working with the University of Memphis and the Center of Research and Educational Policy to collect the data. They are working with us and the grantee partners that we're investing in to identify um, these anticipated outcomes. Of course, we want to measure the number of family um, individuals that an, uh, increase full-time employment for six months or greater, um, what their earned income is over a five-year period, um, the number that possess, uh, possess a high school diploma, the number of children that are enrolled in early quality education care, um, the number of children that are engaged in after school programs, the high school dropout rate, uh, those that enter a post-secondary opportunity, and um, that are receiving regular health checks. This partnership that the Women's Foundation has entered in, um, we were able to secure uh, three million for a job for Jobs Plus Award um, that is granted to the families that live in foot homes. And then the city of Memphis was awarded $30 million in a Memphis Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grant that helps with the revitalization of this entire community. So in working with large um, partner organizations, it, um, we've been able to secure uh, over $33 million um, in investment. That is over and beyond the investment that the Women's Foundation is making to supporting programs within this community. The Women's Foundation has, um, our board has agreed for us to raise a $10, $10 million over the course of five years to support the programs uh, in this model for, for um, our Vision 2020 plan. <clears throat> 
Cynthia men mentioned that the importance of partnership, um, and I wanted to just give you a high-level view of all of the folks that are kind of involved um, at a 30,000-foot view, um, whether that's the housing component of this support to um, our community, uh, whether it's the neighborhood um, component, the people component, which is really where the case management comes in. Um, our role is the philanthropic lead in raising those monies and investing them back in the community, and then the role of our local school system. In sharing um, some of the successes in, uh, that we've had in supporting our families to really being able to obtain and retain employment, one of the things that I wanted to just share was um, we created what's called um, employer-driven employer strategies, where we started really with the employer in mind um, to assess what some of the job needs would be, um, and then really helping focus our, our families and individuals within our community into some of those kind of high growth industry positions. Um, our Chamber of Commerce released a report maybe about two and a half years ago that really focused on what those high growth jobs would be over the next five years. And so with that in mind, we have created relationships with those employers um, to identify what those needs are and then really create a comprehensive curriculum um, that could help us identify individuals that could enter their training programs, but that the case management is really a key component of how we're going to help our families be successful. Some of the things that we've learned is really about the importance of that soft skills training so that when we are preparing um, individuals to go into these job training programs, we have assessed um, what all of their strengths are, what those needs are, and then we can really coach with the support of the employer some of the things that will happen once the individual has obtained employment. One of the things that we really have found that's an important piece of that is really the peer-to-peer -peer, um, connection, whether it's um, before in the job training program and or once individuals have obtained a job with a particular employer. We've worked very heavily with um, some of our local employers, FedEx, Electrolux, um, as well as AutoZone in creating some very specific um, training programs that deal with not only the soft skills piece, but really the technical side of some entry-level positions that, um, that, our, that our families can apply for and then move really up a career ladder because of the growth of these particular industries. We found that customer service and healthcare were one of those industries, information technology, advanced manufacturing, um, construction and trades jobs, as well as transportation and logistics. And so because of that, creating these very um, <coughs> strategic partnerships with these employers helps them identify what has oftentimes been a gap um, in trained employer employees um, it also gives an opportunity for individuals who would not have that kind of access or open door resource to jobs that could uh, that provide a living wage, but also an opportunity for career advancement. And just to share a couple of the lessons learned, um, if there's too many to share in this um, in this webinar, but you know, I'm happy if anyone has, wants to reach out and learn more about um, not only why we took on such a bold initiative, but also why it's important that you have both buy-in, um, and for us, it's been at the city level, it's been at a regional level, and then we've, you know, advanced and created opportunities um, at a national level. But some of the things that we've learned is really informing collaborative partnerships um, that focus on both, you know, readiness, job training, and placement um, in the greater Memphis area really took um, it, was, it took some intentionality, it took some thoughtfulness, and it really took building relationships. Um, one of the things that was a benefit for us is that we came to the table, we set the table with already resources in mind. So creating re an opportunity for people to utilize or leverage um, resources that they already have 
um, with really a streamlined process of how we align those resources, but really how we coordinate the services um, to support low-income families within this community. We understood and, and knew that from our conversations with both employers um, and community-based organizations that um, soft skills was a really key component of that. Because so many of the families that we've worked with are severely underemployed, having the soft skills and the amount of time in tailoring those programs based on the industry uh, was an important piece of really getting to that end goal where folks are able to get employed. Case management is a vital component of all of that. Uh, we begin with case management. We begin with assessing some of the needs of our families. We begin with really creating in our strategies to support our families the two-generation approach. We don't see it as, um, you know, as any kind of bifurcated process. It really has to be integrated that you're meeting the entire needs of the family to really help them get to that end goal. We've learned to work more closely with many of the um, community-based organizations that we're investing in, but also those that have resources, like our, our local WIA board, um, the Workforce Investment Network, because they provide training dollars. So we, again, an opportunity to leverage resources that are already there, but really aligning them um, so that you're coordinating those strategies on behalf of families. And then, of course, the peer-to-peer the -peer piece. Um, in our lessons learned, um, we've learned that having um, a peer-to-peer -peer opportunity or mentoring program in place really motivates and strengthens our families to get to and accomplish their goals. Um, we've created kind of like pilot um, peer ambassador programs that are really focused in specific areas. We have a peer ambassador program that's really focused just in the employment uh, arena. We have a peer ambassador uh, program that supports uh, moms in the early education space. We have a peer ambassador program that's really focused on um, the youth development piece. And that those are residents who either have um, gone through some of our job training programs and been successful, um, or um, have navigated and been able to um, overcome a lot of their barriers. And they use those experiences to really guide and support uh, other women within the program. So I am going to end at that point. Um, Michaela, and I'm open for, I think Cynthia and I wanted to leave a little time for question and answers yeah. if there's an opportunity. So it's it's 11 o'clock, so I just want to be, I just want to um, acknowledge that it's 11 and because of technical difficulties, we're running a little bit behind. Um, but I'd welcome anyone's questions um, from the from the group, from the audience um, at this time. I know I see um, that there's an interest in getting your presentations. Um, are you two, both you and Cynthia, open to sharing them? with the group? Absolutely. Great. So we'll make sure to make those available in our follow-up email and sort of the synopsis from this time. Um, does anybody have any questions from uh, just the attendee side? And you can, uh, don't forget to unmute yourself. You can unmute yourself or you can raise your hand. So I know, one question that was submitted uh, during uh, Cynthia's um, uh, Cynthia's time was how is finance how are the financial considerations different than work hours or scheduling conflicts? Does that mean they couldn't afford to pay for training? That comes from Kelly Nevins. Cynthia, can you unmute yourself? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Okay. So the work hours and scheduling conflicts um, has to do with um, things like if your um, your job conflicts with your childcare arrangements or um, your hours, say your hours um, change on a on a uh, weekly basis, which makes it difficult to figure out um, a childcare system that's going to work for you. Um, whereas the financial considerations to do more with things like, um, you know, paying bills and meeting those basic needs. 
Great, thank you. Um, so, for I have a question for for Shante, and that's just about um, the public private partnership. And so, just wondering if you can describe a little bit about how that worked, and so who who your your um, collaborative partners were. Sure. Um, um, our collaborative partners for the public private partnership really began when our, the city of Memphis was pro, um, applying for Hope Six funds to revitalize low income communities. And they asked us to be the philanthropic partner uh, to support the case management of families who were living in these um, public housing developments. And um, that began maybe about 13 years ago. Um, we've grown that partnership since that time as we have partnered with the City of Memphis and the Memphis Housing Authority um, on four different revitalization projects, and it's really geared from our side and the people um, and the human capital development. It's really how we focus on um, supporting our families to move to economic security. And being the philanthropic lead where we've invested in community-based organizations who provided services to these families was really how we became a partner but when we decided to launch Vision 2020, it was really kind of us putting our stake in the ground and saying there has to be very focused, um, concentrated resources that are um, strategic in their development and their coordination. Um, and it's really why we decided that if you could create a model of comprehensive services where the family was in the center of that model, and you met the needs of the family where they didn't have to go to five different organizations to receive, you know, um, a reference for a GED training. We provide with our families with the comprehensive services needed um, based on what that need is. So we have a provider that provides GED training. We have a provider that provides occupational skills training. We have a provider that provides um, job training based on a particular industry um, so that it's so that the um, there aren't so many barriers that families have to go through just to get um, services that they would need. Um, Shante, just to follow up on that, there's a question from Francine Frazier um, that she asks, how did you leverage resources to build capacity of the identified uh, partners? Please provide examples of what that looks like in the field. Sure. Um, we've leveraged the resources that the city was provided in the Choice Neighborhood Grant as one example. Um, we then applied for other federal funding, um, and that's where we were able to obtain a Jobs Plus um, grant from HUD that really supported um, uh, job training opportunities for families. We then have a, applied for and leveraged funding from national funders, um, whether that was the Walmart Foundation, um, whether that was the Kellogg Foundation, um, and then local. We really um, pushed hard to get a lot of local support, and that's from a lot of local foundations as well as corporations. Um, they all needed to have a stake in this game. They all needed to know the importance of really being able to support a community like 38126 where you have poverty rates of 62% that it's a heavy lift for the city. It's a heavy lift for the entire community. So we've been able to leverage not only federal resources but the money that we've raised on both a local and national front. And then from individuals. Um, that's part of our Vision 2020 plan is that we have not only engaged large foundations and corporations, but, but it's everyday individuals um, to think about what this means for this community and ultimately for our city. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia, there was a follow-up question from Kelly Nevins, I think, um, just back, I think, just going back to what you what you were speaking about earlier, um, and she just asked for clarification around paying bills. Um, she said she was just asking for clarification about whether or not that meant they couldn't go to the training because they they needed to work or sort of I'm just, I guess whether they couldn't go to the training because they had to pay the bills. Does that mean they needed to work rather than go to class? Um, 
Yeah, so I think the question was was just asking participants to um, to identify to, to say what the most common challenges they faced were while in in training that um, made it difficult for them to complete. And for those who had already um, who had taken training in the past, it was asked if they didn't complete, they were asked the follow-up question of why. So some of them selected difficulty paying bills. And if they were in training currently, the question was asked of um, what are some, some of the challenges that might make it difficult for you to complete if they said they were thinking of dropping out. And so um, when they select um, difficulty paying bills, um, yeah, then it, they were just basically saying they were struggling financially and, you know, yes, maybe they would have to work instead of going to training or, um, or yeah, so that was, that was really the, the issue. Great. Thank you. I hope that was clarifying, Kelly. Uh, I think that's all the time we have. We're seven minutes over and I just, um, you know, <laughs> want to be respectful of people's time and other appointments this morning. Um, thank you for, for, uh, participating and thank you so much for your patience as we've sort of gone through a couple of technical difficulties over the course of the hour. Um, please submit your feedback. Um, we'll be I'll be sure to send out um, an email uh, giving you a sort of recap and summary of this webinar, um, including some of the resources that um, Cynthia presented um, in her uh, in her PowerPoint, um, as well as links to both Cynthia and Shante's PowerPoint presentations. Um, our next webinar is going to be in February with the founder of the Criterion Institute, Joy Anderson, and she'll be sharing how you can use finance as a tool for social change. So it'll be a great way to get familiar with gender lens investing. Uh, thanks again for your time and thanks for showing up today. Um, have a good rest of your week. <laughs>